Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so today's topic is um, actually going to be more of a discussion. It's not really a proposal or, or anything like that. Um, it's sort of come to light uh, lately that um, we've had some issues with uh, within OMR and in some downstream projects where um, the the sort of the default behavior of the floating point the, the default floating point semantics that are sort of expected by um, the the simplifier and the um, uh, like value propagation and other parts of the optimizer and the back ends um, and then the interaction with the language environments isn't necessarily consistent and I guess the idea here is to really sort of come to some agreement on where we want to go with um, and, and, and with how to impose some of these uh, semantics on um, on our on our floating point code um, and perhaps even some ideas about how to actually architect that um, because in some cases it may not necessarily be straightforward um, the other thing that we could potentially touch on as well um, is to talk a little bit about the IL op codes themselves that do floating point and see what kind of semantics that we want to that, that we think are um, uh, are appropriate there. So, um, so right. So, do you want to talk about a little bit about the background at all, or about the problem that you were seeing? Um, probably better if you frame it, I guess. Okay. Context. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. So, so one of the the way that the way that um, we had. Thought about architecting the um, a lot of the semantics around floating point was um, the the, uh, the the Omar code is actually supposed to be asking the language environment um, what the semantics actually are and sort of the interface that we have for doing that is this is this is this class that we call the the arithmetic environment the arithenv and it is an extensible class that um, Omar provides an API. Um, it provides a number of questions that can be asked. Um, it's by no means an exhaustive set of questions. Um, and it also provides sort of a default implementation of the answers to those questions. Um, in addition to questions, it actually provides uh, operations that can be done as well. So for example, uh, if you wanted to fold two floating points, uh, if you wanted to fold the addition of two floating point numbers together, in your particular language environment, you would basically call the um, um, that particular function, and it would um, do it the way that that with with the with the semantics that that language environment expects, and returns you the res returns you the result back. Um, uh, if if your project, a downstream project that's consuming OMR, wants to do things differently, um, there are uh, because it's an extensible class, you you can by all means extend that API as you as you see fit, and provide your own implementations of those functions. Um, and you can even add your own um, members to that API as well if you need to ask uh, specific questions for your environment. So um, it, it does build upon the, um, the extensible class framework. Um, however, there, there have been some, some cases where, um, where the, the, um, the, the results that were coming back from OMR were not quite what, um, what one might expect. And, um, I think one of the one of the things that we need to to come to, to, come to maybe some some um, agreement on here is um, what are the semantics that we should be providing um, at the I guess the arithmetic layer um, and um, should OMR actually be providing a default or should it actually just be providing the API and every language environment has to be responsible for um, providing some kind of an implementation for for that. So, or, or I guess there's one other design point, right, which is that you have an API, you could have a set for one or more implementations, they're just not selected by default, right? Yes. Um, so you could have a spectrum from we just bake it in through to we have an API, but we give you a default implementation and we're mm -hmm. just going to assume that that's okay, mm -hmm. or we give you an API, we give you an implementation, but you have to do the one line of code or whatever to actually connect the API to the implementation to get right. that. Get that. Right. Um, that providing doing it that way would add a little uh, adds an, an extra level of indirection, I think, to the to the way that the class. If, if, if we're going to use the extensible class mechanism for that. Then that adds sort of an extra layer of indirection onto that, where you have the API, but the actual implementation gets sort of dynamically loaded or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. 
The nice thing about that as well is that you can actually, we can actually test a variety of different floating point implementations as well. Like we don't have to actually build a separate compiler for each set of floating point semantics that we want. We can sort of swap them in as, as necessary. Mm -hmm. So, um, so any any thoughts on on that? Uh, well, I think in, based on the discussions last time, I, I think it wouldn't come as a surprise to people who were involved in that that my my position would be to to do the the API, but not provide uh, yeah. an initial uh, an implementation, like provide the option of selecting an implementation. We could certainly have an implementation in OMR, but that it's not on by default. Right. What were the um, sorry? It's, it's not swapped in my head right now. What were the implications on the simplifier that were um, that were problematic. Um, the, the case that came to mind was that we were doing a square root optimization that was implying certain semantics. Yes. And what was ending up happening is that the actual back, the back end was changing, was providing a different implementation or a different set of semantics for that square root operation. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. So I think that the issue, I think we saw that in the context of Open J9's use of when when when, when we had the OMR implementation, and I think that was just implemented using uh, the C compilers uh, implementation that compiled to whatever it compiles to, and, and that was the implementation. But that was not compliant in uh, I don't know if it was it was something related to precision. Now whether it was the rounding mode or some other detail of the implementation that was different. It didn't produce the identical answer to what the Java specification required, um, and so we were starting to wring our hands a bit over. So in the uh, simplification, so in the simplifier, yeah. um, so we attempted to do a square root simplification, like a folding, let's say, of, yeah. of that square root, and we. Yeah. So in that case, it did not call. I know we don't have one yet. I think actually Victor has a PR for that, but it, it, we did not call. The arithmetic library to actually do the folding. Correct. Right? We we just yeah. yeah we just use the right the compiler's implementation. So the okay and so the problem there would be that the the default square root that we would have produced may produce a different result than what that the Java ultimately would require. Right. Right. And um, it can get even more subtle for different languages because uh, while the implementation that the C compiler provides may in fact be compliant, mm -hmm. um, the rounding mode that the hardware is configured into by the compiled code versus by the runtime mm -hmm. could end up being different and in rare circumstances produce different answers in terms of final sort of point, decimal point precision kind of things where, or, or for example, if you had compiled with a compiler that was using x87 or something like that, right, you could end up with an implementation that carried 80 bits of precision rather than strictly the um, the 64 or, the, or whatever that you specified. Um, I've not, I've, I guess I've never really been super keen on relying on just the C runtime as sort of the default implementation of floating point, um, just because I'm not sure that we're getting consistent results between different build compilers that we have with with, um, with OMR, at least. Um, I'm wondering if we need to be a little bit stricter and let's say that, well, if we were going to choose one, and perhaps this could be one of the many that we do provide, but like an IEEE 754 compliant one would be the, would be one of the ones that we basically standardize on. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, at least based on my sort of limited experience in other runtimes, right, there's, there are runtimes who basically make their floating point um, default to whatever the C compiler is, is going to do, right? Like if you have a, a C interpreter loop, right, like Matt's interpreter loop mm -hmm. or something like that, um, there will be parts of the floating point implementation which are um, compiler defined. Mm -hmm. um, so there's certainly going to be a class of language implementation where if you're building OMR as part of that runtime, mm -hmm. if you are using the runtime to do it in your language as it is, the most compatible thing for OMR to do is to use the runtime. Now, it's not the C, the C runtime. Now, that's not necessarily going to produce 
consistent results across platforms. Um, and, you know, having another implementation that uses LibM or, or whatever mm -hmm. um, to provide a, a compliant um, implementation would be sensible. But at that point, that's really, a, I, I feel, a question for the, um, the, the person implementing OMR into a runtime to, to specify which one they want, right, rather than sort of giving them one by default and kind of hoping that it's right. Um, it's sufficiently subtle and hard to debug that you could spend days trying to find out why the precision is off and point the finger of blame at the optimizer or something um, when it's really down to one of these operations. So do we provide like a, a add normal then? So there, there already is. Yeah. No, no, no. So there already is as part of that, uh, like the language environment. Um, Communication. There already is a float add add or an add float float, right? So take one float and add it to another float. A language environment would implement that. Um, so the API is defined, and then the default implementation of that right now, what, what actually lives in the CPP file is basically using whatever the C compiler does, right? Whatever the whatever that build compiler actually is doing. Um, so the question is whether or not we just define we just provide the API and then the the the, um, uh, the the consumer of this technology needs to come out and pick the actual implementation that they want, right? Like, do they want C semantics? Do they want IEEE 754 precisely? Do they want something else, that kind of thing? Or do they want, let's say, Java, in which case Java would have to provide their own? Are we just talking about optimizations or the actual the IL actual. evaluators? <laughs> uh, well, I don't you have to also deal with the generated code? Yeah. Yes. That's what I mean. Yeah. Somebody who wants to have specific floating point requirements and wants to inform the optimizer. And right. The so that's getting into the, the semantics of the actual opcode, right? Do you have an F add opcode? What, right. what are the... What is the default the semantics of that? Right. Which is also not specified. No, no it's not. Well. And in fact, we probably should specify that at some point. But so which problem are we dealing with? Uh, well, the problem, first or? problem... As these, are, these are both problems we have to address at some point, right? But the, the first problem was the, the actual semantics of the, the if, you, if you actually use the arithmetic environment class, what what's the default? What answers are going to be returned, right? And how do you provide those answers? How does the project provide those answers? You guys are right that we need to start looking further deeper into the compiler and what happens with the code gen as well, when you actually, or even interpreting the semantics of the, of the IL opcode. Yeah. I think there's two classes of issue that, um, that I think there's two pragmatic concerns here though, right? The, there's there's work actively being done in the project to enhance things like simplifier to improve their handling of floating point values. So there's new code being added and then there's the existing code base that has whatever semantics it has from the legacy of how it was implemented. and. Um, my concern, at least in the discussions that were happening on the items, was that um, the committers do not currently have a way of um, evaluating the correctness of the new code that's being proposed. Now, if the current evaluators need updating or something to become compliant with whatever we end up making the decision, that's the second issue, right? But I, I think the problem is at the moment we don't even know how to review the contributions that people are trying to make to improve this, this aspect of the compiler, right? Um, okay. Um, people have so looking specifically at that at that interface layer. Do people have thoughts about whether or not OMR should be very specific about this is the default implementation, and if you want something else, you actually you have to be very meticulous about overriding it all, or should we architect something that's got a menu of options and you have to basically build in the one that you want, pick and, and then build in the one you want with the understanding that there might be a little bit of inefficiency with that because we probably do have to introduce an extra layer of indirection on into, into that interface if we're going to continue to use like an extensible class uh, mechanism for, for that. Um, I think uh, provide uh, 
sort of providing a default and forcing someone's hand, the equivalent would be providing one implementation and giving them, having them define the one liner, because uh, that gives you a lot more flexibility and um, if you want to define another one down the road, uh, or having multiple, um, and it forces the user to really think about what they're doing. So what we have right now is just one, if we have a... Right, but it's also the default. So you don't really have to do anything to get it to work, quote unquote. Um, whereas providing, sure, the one default, but you have to put in the one liner specifying, okay, yes, I want IEEE 754 semantics. Yeah. I guess you kind of have to do that right now because you actually have to add that to your make file, right? You actually have to choose that file to build it to, to, to basically build, right? That's the implementation. That's the OMR implementation of that interface. You're already picking that one. So it's recognizing that because you're picking that one to build, you're making a conscious choice that I want, that, that you want. You're accepting that. But even for something like OpenJ9, I think they have to build both that version and the J9 extension of it, right? So you're building the one that you don't want and the one that you do want, just to make the linker happy at this point, um, which isn't a great design either. Seems slightly suboptimal. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I do agree with the point about the cognitive um, effort and requiring the thought to go in to say. So is this actually a more general, so is this more a more general problem than just floating point? So are there other, presumably there could be other areas of all of this technology where um, you're not really aware of what the default actually is and you, or, or there, there could be some things that you should be opting into or at least you're conscious that you're opting into them. Um, because maybe this is a more general pattern that we have to architect in, as opposed to making it specific to just floating point, uh, floating point API. Do you have an example in mind in making that statement? I'm. I threw that as a. That's why I threw it as a question. Okay. With a question rather than a statement. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we have anything other than tooth complement, <laughs> yeah. binary addition, or math arithmetic. Well, the other phase may be like the, the little Indian versus big Indian, so which we yeah. nowadays like, kind of like we <laughs> attune ourselves to little Indian. I, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't limiting, I wasn't thinking about limiting it to just floating point. I guess right. It could be a, any aspect of the, the technology that we have and whether or not you need to be aware of what's actually happening, or you should be aware of what's happening in the default implementation. But I think if there's that, like little engine, big engine, it's still sub lots of bugs. Yeah. People sort of forget about it and somehow make it more obvious. But it's not something you can choose. I mean, your platform. Yeah, I know, I know. But um, sort of like separate them and say evaluate them more clearly. This is little engine, this is big engine. Sort of like something to remind people that you need to think about. Right. So maybe this is also tying into maybe what Eunice was saying about the that the evaluators need to be aware of what the floating point semantics are as well, right? Semantic because you need, you need a different potentially a different implementation. Mm -hmm. I think this is two uh, issues that people always forget. Yeah. No, I, I think that the floating point one is particularly nasty because of the number of choices, number of possible yeah. choices that exist, right? Yeah. Like, um, I, I do agree that Endian is certainly a complicated yeah, but thing. Is only one, right? There's only one correct choice. Yes, yeah, you, it, it's A or B, right? Whereas yeah. the floating point you could have, um, like with Java, you can have methods marked strict test P, and that actually changes the floating point semantics inside that method in, in a subtle way. Um, so I think if floating point is particularly nasty in that in that particular regard, it may not be unique, uh, but it's certainly particularly complex. So the so so changing the so a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of the areas that get sort of affected by um, these different kinds of semantics are really sort of table-driven, right? Like you've got simplifier table and then VP, table for VP, and you've got all the the, the, the cogen evaluators and all that are sort of driven by 
Um, if you wanted to provide different semantics in some of those cases, I'm just going to throw this out there. Is it is it perhaps one of the things that could be done is actually uh, for some project to actually replace entries in those tables with what it wants. the semantics of, of that environment. Um, I don't think we do a little bit of that already in the cogen. A little bit. Maybe not all cogen. Um, I think the way the simplifier is currently architected, there's quite a lot of boilerplate that have to sort of go around the actual simplification. Yeah. So you don't, want you don't want to have to duplicate that boilerplate, which yeah. is kind of the concern. And you can create an extension point, but then the class gets even more complicated, and that's not really something I'd be interested in. Right. Um, on the other hand, though, if we actually, and perhaps this is something that we would ultimately, approach, if we actually did define that, let's say, F add. The F add opcode has to provide these exact semantics, right? Like, let's say it has to be IEEE 754 compliant for single for 23 bit precision and in, in, in round to nearest mode and all that kind of stuff. Um, then, then um, you wouldn't be changing your simplifier because it, it, that the simplification at that opcode is supposed to be following those, those semantics. But I don't think any Compiler actually provides that level of yeah. preciseness to the to its floating point semantics, does it? And, and some internal representation. Of course, it, it most will. platforms have an ABI that, yeah. that defines it. Yeah. In C, so we see push class, it would be an implementation detail, and most implementations they just go by the C ABI. Technically, you could define you know, each compiler could go its own way, but they they all kind of have to interoperate with each other. Nobody makes a compiler that is completely incompatible with yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the other compilers on the platform. So they all kind of mm -hmm. agree on on. So um, crazy off the wall idea. What if the implementation of the floating point folding was basically to generate the implementation for the folding from the evaluator. Like if you have to implement F add in the code gen evaluator, it's going to generate a sequence based on some nodes that have registers and it's going to generate a sequence of instructions to generate a result into a register. Surely the right way to fold F add is to run the evaluator <laughs> essentially on it. So could you use JIT Builder or something similar to actually gen the evaluator for a given node and use the evaluator to, to do the folding, then you only have to implement the code gen and yeah. it's always going to be consistent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I like this idea. Well, you don't even emulate it. You, you basically just binary encode the thing to right. read memory. You run it. You run it. Then, there, then there's only one definition, that's the evaluator. And to guarantee the simplifier to this. You guarantee the that. simplifier does the same damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> Now, there's rounding mode issues and things like that, but if you're busy swapping rounding modes around all the time, then right. good luck to you anyway. But you could make that explicit in the evaluation. That would work with constants. Mm -hmm. You had everything at, in hand at compile time, but what if, yep. what, if you're, what if you're simplifying an algebraic expression where you don't have, you know, you don't have those values you at compile time? Mm -hmm. But the, the, the simple, for the simplifier to be simplifying something at compile time where the result of the math is important, you must be combining constants in some way. Otherwise, you're just reordering existing trees and you don't need to call folding logic, right? So there's two classes of these things. There's the ones where you're reordering trees and that may have an impact on the order of evaluation. And then there's the class of, okay, well, I have an F add of an F mole, and I want to turn it into an F mole of an F add. 
and I'm going to factor the multiplication across the ad or something like that, yeah. then I'm going to transform a constant in the part that where the, the danger part that I guess we're talking about in the simplifier is where I transform that constant in some way. I guess I would be arguing that the constant transformation would be the thing you would feed through the evaluator. Now, the rearrangements may be another class of thing, but they're different again than what we were just discussing, which is the actual evaluation. Well, so basically, you would you would write. Yeah. Like five plus six. Yes. Yeah. So what you would do is when you start up the when you load the JIT, it would take the floating point evaluators in your code generator, and it would run each one to generate a snippet that does the equivalent of that node. And if you want to constant fold a node, you take the evaluator for that, feed the constant in. It will run exactly the sequence that your evaluator would have generated and gives you an answer back. Pre-generated. Pre-generated. Yeah. So that you have single definition. Some variants of that would be possible to do. I had to make that happen, but yeah, that's the I guess, uh, I mean, even also breaking, I mean, the, the, the API that we have right now um, in the, the language for the language environment, the arithmetic environment, is not particularly rich. It's just got a couple of questions and maybe a number of about 10 or so operations, right, for multiplying, and adding, and subtracting, and that kind of stuff. I guess we could add, we could round that out quite a bit more, and then making sure that when we're generating floating point code, we ask we need to ask questions all the time to know exactly what exactly what kind of code that we should be producing from that to try to make it a lot more generic than maybe it already is. Um, and even the simplifier could do that too, right? Right, but I guess the, the the concern, one concern that I would have with that model, I guess, is just that you don't want to have to litter the code with thousands, you know, dozens of checks, yeah. with dozens of paths that may be rarely, if ever, executed that may have bugs lurking in them. Um, so, I mean, that, that would be a concern that I have is that you have a, trying to make a change in there could get very complicated. I'm not sure how, how many of those you actually would end up using. I don't think we'll get. I don't think we'll get to the point where there's dozens. So, any thoughts on um, defining semantics around the actual IL opcode? What does it mean to be an FAD or a D sub or something like that? How much floating pointness do we need to bake into that? And then, like you, like you were saying, like leave it up to the ABI, sort of a commonly accepted ABI on the target that you're going to be running on. Because at some point, we're going to one of the things that we want to do is to actually provide more of a specification for the IL. And so part of it is going to be providing. You know, at least some expectation of what it means when you're going to be using some of these operators or some of these, um, yeah, some of these IL opcodes. Right. I think right now the IL is doing hardware semantics. Like when you generate a node that does something, the evaluator, at least on power, generates the corresponding power instruction. So you get you get the hard you get hardware semantics. I don't know if that's it. And the hardware would be backed by some standard. It's not necessarily the same. Uh, it doesn't necessarily match the CABI. The hardware behavior of a shift doesn't necessarily match CABI, but the C 
see compiler generates code that that makes it conform on, on power. So it would, you know, it would generate a rotate, but then it would mask off you know, the, the bits that the, that the hardware leaves to make it conformant. Uh, in, in in OMR, we we just generate a shift, and usually the IL makes it conformant. So there's a specific case somewhere in Simplifier that I can't remember offhand, um, but I always refer to it when the question comes up. Um, but we we generate something, and Simplifier asks. You got to mask the bits or something for Jeff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think there's probably other cases as well for floating point. Finding it to be with the hardware. I mean, that has advantages because it's fixed, right? Everybody's operating under the same. The, the complexity is moved out. Up. At the same time. The problem then is if you actually do have, let's say, some kind of a simplifying operation on that opcode, you now you have to make it architecture specific potentially because simplifying it, I'm not sure if I've got an example off the top of my head, but simplifying it on power might be different than the way that you potentially simplify it on X or something else. Yeah. Well, but from, from the sum of the X, uh, X coding evaluator, it seems like the we expect the uh, the IO ops to comply in Java standard. For example, the uh, the floating to integer conversion, uh, floating floating point to integer conversion IO. Like we have actual like a ton of actual logic to make it comply for Java standard, which is different from from the hardware or the C API. So uh, I guess maybe right now there isn't any like defined standard, like a defined stack for the IL. And different IL ops may be different. Um, different, well, even on different. Yeah, I guarantee different, that yeah. they are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah, we were just saying that we have to make a specification right. for that so that there is at least clarity and agreement that this yeah. is how it's supposed to behave. Um, but, you know, but we don't have a great answer on like that. One example that the Unis has been the shift, for example, on how you would simplify that on different architectures right. or, or even different projects, right? Because then you'd have to have J9 would have to override the simplifier handler in some way. Or I think you want to answer the question of somebody's consuming Omar. Do you want them to go all the way down to the code gen to, to implement these things, or do you want them to implement it in the app? You have to think about the consumers. And if you if you want them to go all the way down to the to the code generators, then they have to do this on every platform that they want to support. Whereas if you make a decision for them that you know, the IL behaves this way, whatever this way is, either hardware or specific, I this or, or yeah. yeah, whatever. And so it kind of defeat the. I guess goals of Omar and that the IL um, to kind of cross platform. If you have to implement it for every platform, I can almost guarantee you, at least speaking for Z, you have to make get, somebody go down to the code. Yeah. To... They will certainly not, for example, they're like very likely to implement just 86 or. Well, then, no, no, but that making them go all the way to the code gen to implement their semantics makes the IL cross. Like the same IL, they generate the same IL, yeah, and they get the right behavior on every platform because they went ahead and changed yeah. what the evaluator does to make it right. Whereas if the if the evaluators all behave the same way and implement one thing, then you end up with different IL on every platform to make it consistent. So if you wanted to handle that shift case that you were talking about, in that case, um, you would implement the correcting semantics in IL, like you would need to add the and and the of the, of the shift yeah, yeah, and all that kind of yeah. stuff as, as part of the IL as opposed to just, oh, this is a shift on Java, so I know I yeah. naturally need to do that. Um, I don't know which one is right or wrong, better or worse. Yeah. 
boil it down. That seems to be the, the choice. Fix one and make the other variable, or yes. fix this side, make this side variable, or fix that side, make this side variable. I do kind of like that. I mean, personally, I, I'm giving it a huge amount of thought, but I, I, I kind of like the idea of a consistent dial story. I think the optimizer relies on consistent dial. If the meaning of the opcodes changes, there's nothing that the optimizer can do. Well, there's a yeah. Right. You, you cannot have an optimizer if the meaning of the node that it's meant to observe okay. is not consistent. But it would be different, different dial semantics. It would just be different dial treats. Right? You wouldn't just have a shift. You'd have shift and an end. The optimizer would have to ask code generator for every everything that can change. How do I do this correctly? I have to generate, you know, yeah, that'll be around it to me. Do that of hand, probably. Right now, we kind of have a little bit of both. Right? There's some shift on power. Simplifier does massages the trees to make them correct. And then for the x86 case, x86 code generator you know, goes through hoops to make it correct. So like we have a foot in each each camp, basically. Yeah. Right. So only if you if you were to deviate from the specification of the IL, would you need to implement the evaluators on all the platforms you want to support? You have specific needs, and you if we want the IL to stay the same across platforms. Specific needs for specific. You need specific IOS to behave in specific ways. You know, specific architectures. You would have to go in and generate the appropriate code to make it. Your IL generator will have to generate to, to emulate the behavior or to, to, to provide the behavior you want using sort of the building blocks of the IL that we have, right? Right. Um, so that's where the different points would be. And then the question we. Would the optimizer, for example, be able to catch that shape of tree? Like this is now my, sh this is what now what a shift looks like on this, on this particular platform, whatever. Is the optimizer able to sort of see through that? Um, maybe not. But. I guess all of this is just complicated by the fact that we have a very large existing code base that does it in multiple different ways. And so trying to get everything harmonious is going to be um, maybe a bit challenging. Like we're architecting something from scratch. But the good news is that one implementation is only one set that was just X, you like to use the other one language. Might be useful to think about what your potential consumers today would need. Like, what does Python do? What does Ruby do? What does Swift do? What does and yeah. try to whatever you come, we come up yeah, with? Yeah. Would be nice. What does it do? It. Yeah. Leo. I mean, I, could, I think I know what Python does. It does what C does. So <laughs> I just do that. Yeah, <laughs> it's I mean, the easiest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess surveying some of the different language environments and what if there's any sort of unique kind of semantics that they that they have, and understanding how we can use that. Like on, on even on Swift, they had the you could actually capture the notion of overflow of the two. On, yeah, uh, same on yeah. .NET languages. We had a new, 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 uh, new node for that where you overflow check. What does it mean with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be made. 
I mean, that's a good way of making it generic as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, some of those, some of these questions, I think, are, are discussions that we can uh, continue when we get closer to working on the different parts of the IL and, and specifying that. Um, and hoping to make some progress on that over the over the summer, so that at least we get some kind of going in the right going in the right direction there. Um, but back to the um, um, immediate topic of the of, the, of, of today was um, so I think that um, maybe kind of include the, the, the summary of maybe what we could do there is to look into um, providing an API in OMR an explicit opt-in from a consumer for floating point related things um, providing perhaps multiple implementations that one could be that, that could be chosen, decompiler, I triple E seven fifty four, whatever F you live in, let's say whatever. Um, and then having some way of, of, of selecting it and then choosing it. So. Um, so I guess the only pragmatic question is that there are pull requests yeah. open. Uh, what is the standard to be used to assess those for integration into OMR? And to avoid breaking downstream implementations, either Open J9 or other languages like Lua that may not currently expect those things to start happening. So in the in the and in the in the ones that are open, um, are, are they falling back to just Java semantics? Like the semantics? Is that what they do? Uh, so what do you what? I mean, for mine? Yeah, that's the square uh, root one. For the square root one, the Java semantics is. Same as x86 based instruction semantics. So uh, I would say it compliance with both. And well, the only exception I have to make is for like when we don't have like SSE support, the well, uh, the hardware is always there, but it's like um, the, that's a, the OMR, when OMR doesn't use x86, uh, doesn't use SSE. Yeah. Then I have to do some like um, some conversions from x eighty seven registers to like uh, SSE and then run the, run the instructions. I did that is because the x eighty seven instructions is not compliant with Java semantics. So right now for the um, do we have square root tests in, in OMR? Uh, uh, test it's it's added with my my pull request. Okay, so we don't you'd almost have to exclude that on x eighty six then. Because you can't run that with x87, right? Uh, like what happens yeah. right now when you run? Let me double. Oh, well, the thing. Um, well, the thing is, since the OMR runtime is compiled against SSE, so the C library, the C library will choose compliance with Java standard, right? mm -hmm. which uses the SSE instructions. They might like when <clears throat> to work on that issue. I make the I made the well I still use SSE instructions to generate well to generate the well I still use SSE instructions to do the square root when the OMR says I like, use x eighty seven as default. Because the runtime itself like requires that's the SSE, so at that time it's safe to use SSE instructions. Just the rest of coaching doesn't it doesn't Generate as an instruction, so I have to do a conversion before and after the square root. Okay, so um, I guess recognizing the fact that we actually have to make um, probably some semantic changes um, in terms of how, to, which may not necessarily happen in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I mean, we're talking. Yeah. Well. Figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, and get everyone to kind of buy in on that, and then actually do the implementation, and so on. So that could take um, a few weeks. But um, um, I, I think kind of on a taking some of these things on a case by case basis. I mean, as long as as long as the change seems reasonable and it's not 
um, as long as it isn't uh, going away from the direction that I guess I think we just talked about here, and it sort of fits in with the rest of however OMR is implemented at the moment, then that could be one standard, but I think it's kind of case by case. Not sure if that's the answer that. Well, I mean, it's hard to define the, the reality. <laughs> yeah, I understand it's three hours. Um, I guess if that's what we're going to say, well, that's fine. We at least have a direction that the API is supposed to be going. So things that bake more of it into the simplifier rather than delegating it at least to some point somewhere in the code to be able to say, this is where we do it. And, and then making sure that those kinds of floating point um, code that wants to get committed asks, asks, the right, asks the language environment when it's doing things, right? It asks the right questions of it. There's another one coming for FMAs, right? Yep. Which don't apply to Java necessarily. Yeah. Pretty much never according to the floating point model that we have. Except for that one class that we can, class of method we can. Yes. Where explicitly FMA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, well, I, I can live with that. I guess it's just that yeah, I think this is an important thing for OMR to get nailed down. Okay. Any more discussion on that topic? Okay, um, I guess that's it then. Okay, thanks everyone.